Putin miscalculated so badly when he invaded Ukraine in February 2022. But before we look at that, we've got to look at the causes of the war. One of the strangest things about this war is that a year on, experts continue to debate why it started. There is also a pantheon of people who predicted the war for incompatible reasons. In fact, much of the debate has fallen into a bad cultural trap. People dividing into enclosed bubbles according to whichever explanation is entertaining and therapeutic for them and, moreover, fits with their position in the culture wars in their country. But this is not a reason to give up. It's a reason to stand up for thinking for ourselves about the war and about the informational environment in which we debate the war. The constellation that comes first in the explanation of why Putin started this disastrous war is a combination of regime security wanting to stay in power and a existential challenge to the West. And we're going to hear about both of these parts as we go through Putin's mistakes. But let's not forget something. We're talking about mistakes made along the way to trying to realize an unbelievably destructive project. So we're going to be glad that these mistakes were there. Let's go. Let's go back to 2012, when semi-president Medvedev was removed from his reservation, where he was two-thirds being president, one-third playing president. <laughs> and then Putin returned with a new sense of mission. He now felt that his career and the collective self-realization of Russian civilization were the same thing. And this often happens to autocrats, you know, that they come to feel that their self-advancement and their moral intuitions are just the same thing. So the moral thing to do is to do the most self-serving thing. Now, this can happen to democratic leaders too. For example, I'm in Britain and here Tony Blair many years ago got delusional and messianic about his mission to remove Saddam's evil from the world. But that's Blair getting Iraq wrong. Yeah, what happens with Putin is that he gets all politics wrong. And it's at this point that Putin begins talking to Peter the Great, Catherine the Great, Tsar Alexander III, with whom he had a big love affair. And he talks about them from a position of historical ignorance and amateurishness. So he's talking to sort of made up versions of these people, not the real thing. The point here is that he is drifting from thinking about his role on the international stage in terms of what we would consider rational geopolitical calculation into a kind of mode of quasi-mystical thinking about the political world. This got worse with the kind of Rasputinization of Putin under the conditions of pandemic isolation. At that point, Putin started seeing fewer and fewer people. And don't forget, this is happening in a kind of informal quasi-mafia regime. So there is a complete absence of discipline and checks and balances. And this is perfect recipe for grandiosity and loss of monitors to planet Earth. Now, some commentators call this the Valentinovich period of Putin because Yuri and Mikhail Kovalchuk have a middle name, that's Valentinovich. Mikhail Valentinovich Kovalchuk and Yuri Valentinovich Kovalchuk are important people in Russia who Putin understands as having something important to say about Russia's civilizational mission. And that point is about how Putin is actually open to being manipulated. He is cynical, but he's cynical about facts and information. He's gullible, actually, when it comes to sort of mock metaphysical images of Russia's civilizational self-realization. It's an interesting question how far the isolation and that kind of influence and manipulation um, cast him further adrift from reality. Now you've seen 
Putin's elite at the Security Council meeting before the war. I mean, these are people who are afraid, who are corrupted and co-opted. They're people who no longer think for themselves, no longer hear themselves speak, and are hopelessly incapable of shifting Putin unless they're in such an extreme situation that not shifting him away from the throne is going to pose an existential and immediate threat to their life. And the elites lower down in the regime are interesting because they in part share the depoliticization that many Russian citizens feel. We'll talk about that in a second. But they also share a kind of resignation about the war, that they can't do anything about it. And then there is something worse. And that's the feeling that, okay, this war is a disaster, but now that we have started it, we are powerless to stop it, so we might as well get behind the idea of winning it. Now, Putin begins the war with a population that is in the midst of a crisis of political apathy and political responsibility, actually. And so the population and Putin are, at this point, before the war, playing a game which is called authoritarian capitalism. And that means that Putin says to the population, you can have private freedoms, you can travel around, you can leave the country, you can even criticize the government in very limited contexts. But basically, in exchange for that, you do have to give up public liberty. And if you ever organize on a collective level, online or offline, against the regime, nobody will protect you. you know? So don't do that. You've got a population that has, over many years, outsourced political and economic power and decisions to the Kremlin. We're leading our private lives. They are doing politics over there. And the war is a kind of extraordinary culmination of that deal in a kind of apocalyptic collapse off a cliff because that arrangement with politics has proved catastrophic for Russians. But this is the context we need to understand is entering the war with perhaps half or more than half of the population in this depoliticized state. And then the rest of the population are strongly and coherently against the war or strongly and coherently for the war. But in both cases, we're talking about a 20% bit on either side. Now, before the war, the West was relatively united in its understanding that Putin's potential invasion is a very bad idea. But Putin thought once he started it, that the West would fragment. And there is here a kind of dogma in the Kremlin that is almost a sort of Fukuyamianism in reverse. Francis Fukuyama famously wrote an article in 1989 and a book in 1992 which said that there is a tendency for societies to converge, at least in principle if not in practice, on something like a global civilization modeled around a particular expression of democratic capitalism. And Putin kind of believes that in reverse, that the predicament of Western democracies isn't contingent, but it's on a kind of inexorable tendency of collapse. Putin basically thinks that democracy isn't real. And because it's not real, it's never going to sustain itself for any length of time. And that means you can wait for it to collapse, but that could take a long time. So you've got to prod it so that you can accelerate that outcome. And what does that outcome look like? Well, it just looks like a bunch of Viktor Orbans are in power in the United States, in Britain, in France, in Germany. And Putin thought this could be accelerated into reality by a kind of lightning application of violence in Europe. So Georgia or Syria ain't going to scare Europeans. But if we invade Ukraine, a European country, that'll get Westerners scared and will make them negotiate with us on our terms. And our terms are that we want a complete reconstitution of the international order and effectively a dissolution of NATO. And it's interesting here that Putin completely failed to predict the moral outrage of Western citizens who looked at Ukrainians and said, well, that looks similar enough to us. That could be us. This is very bad. We hate this. 
and this put pressure on Western states to act. So this was a case of morality being causally important in politics, something that Putin believes is impossible. Now, Putin's got a conflicted view about the lack of sovereignty, as he sees it, of East European states. There's a part of him that thinks that their sovereignty is just a byproduct of what major powers do. But in conflict with that, he thinks that their sovereignty is actually zero, no matter what major powers say. That they are sort of like river-going boats at sea. They can stay afloat, but as soon as a storm comes, Czechia, Poland, Hungary are going to sink. Now, there is a way in which these two conflicting bits come together in Putin's thought. And that's that he thinks that the United States sincerely says that Poland has sovereignty, but that when push comes to shove, the United States is going to realize that if only it understood its own interests properly, it would realize that it didn't have a significant interest in the sovereignty of any East European country. And it's that logic that leads Putin to conclude that if challenged under the right historical conditions, NATO's Article 5 would collapse and NATO would dissolve. Now, contrary to the world's expectations and to Putin's expectations, Ukraine held and Ukraine is fighting for its freedom. And the only question is, what's going to be the cost of this battle? The Ukrainian state held, particularly at the local level, where regional authorities showed functionality and competence. Zelensky turned out to be a great war leader. The Ukrainian military turned out to have made enormous progress since 2014. And Ukrainian civil society came together around some sense of political belonging that's inclusive, that's pluralistic, that brings together folks in Eastern and Western Ukraine in clearly saying, Mr. Putin's imperialism, out. We're not going to have it. Two beliefs of Mr. Putin's come together that make him delusional about Ukraine. The first is that just like he believes democracy is epiphenomenal, isn't real, so he believes that revolutions aren't real. That's why he is so triggered by Lenin, but comparatively sanguine about Stalin, because Lenin was a revolutionary and a foreign agent. But Putin thinks that revolutions aren't real. Why? Because they are not domestically produced. You've got a revolution, you've got malign foreign interference causing it. That's how he thinks it works. And he sees that, reads that onto recent Ukrainian history. So 2014, the Maidan is for Putin, not evidence of democratic consciousness in Ukraine, of the formation of a political culture. For him, it's evidence of malign foreign interference. So the more Ukraine says, we know who we are, this is what we stand for, and we want democracy, the more that's evidence for Mr. Putin that in fact Ukraine is just a kind of glove worn by American imperialism trying to destabilize Kremlin power. The second delusion of Putin's is that he thinks Ukrainians are really Russians deep down. So that's different to the kind of colonial approach that says you are inferior to us and we're going to come and civilize you. That's not Mr. Putin's position. Mr. Putin's position is Ukrainians are not inferior to us. They just are us who've forgotten they're us. But what about when Ukrainians stand up and say, no, we are not Russia. In fact, at the moment, we are anti-Russia in every way possible. Well, Putin just takes that as evidence of a lack of Ukrainian agency, because surely they wouldn't be resisting unless they were so propped up by the United States. So the more Ukraine expresses its identity, the more Putin gets convinced that they're just Russians deep down. And this business of any instability at home being a product of malign foreign interference is central to understanding the causes 
of the war because Putin thinks that he cannot meet regime security goals unless he meets his foreign policy goals and the other way around. So Putin's foreign policy becomes consolidating his regime and his domestic policy becomes a big war with the West. Now, we haven't talked about how Mr. Putin overestimated his military. We haven't talked about Russian intelligence failure. We haven't talked about how Mr. Putin does not use the internet in 2023. And that's because I wanted to focus on those mistakes, which are unlearnable. They are things that Putin is not going to be able to correct. Because the more evidence the world presents to Mr. Putin about his mistakes, the more he becomes convinced that they aren't mistakes at all. Putin's civilizational mission is now stronger than ever. He continues to be isolated. His elites, apart from the Rasputinite ideological influence he is after, are a million miles away from checking him, let alone overthrowing him. Putin continues to think that the West will eventually let go of Eastern Europe, give or take a year or a decade. He continues to think that Ukraine does not exist and Ukraine asserting itself, fighting back, defeating him is all the more evidence that it's just the United States pulling the strings. Putin's project will end in self-immolation no matter how much short-term success he gets in Ukraine. And depending on how badly things go for Mr. Putin, Crimea might become Ukrainian. We haven't spoken about Crimea, but it's central to the imperialist conversations we've briefly had. And Russia's Crimea myth that dates back to Catherine the Great is central to Putin's aggression against Ukraine 2014 and on. And to understand more about that, watch this video next.